Howard County, Maryland, a county known for its history and charm, is full of interesting stories. One such story surrounds an old tavern called Spurrier's Tavern, later called Waterloo Tavern, and five generations of two local families. Howard County, located south and west of Baltimore, has been the site of many historic roads. In 1807, the first section of the Baltimore Fredericktown Turnpike opened. It later became known as the National Road to the West. In the early 1830s, the first railroad opened through Ellicott City and the Patapsco Valley, heading west. In 1835, with the building of the Thomas Viaduct over the Patapsco River, the Washington branch of the b and Railroad continued to Washington. In the middle 1700s, the North-South Road was extended from Elk Ridge to the Potomac River tobacco ports of Bladensburg and Georgetown. This road became more important after Washington, D.C. became the nation's capital in 1800. Later, a turnpike company was chartered to improve the North-South Baltimore-Washington Road. The turnpike opened as sections were completed in the 1810s and 1820s. The introduction of the railroad in the 1830s drastically reduced traffic on the turnpike, keeping it mostly local. In the years that followed, road traffic made a comeback with the invention of the automobile and the paving of roads. In the early 1920s, the road, called Route 1, was the main north-south road on the East Coast until the Baltimore-Washington Parkway was built in the 1950s and Interstate 95 was opened in the 60s and 70s. From the beginning of the automobile age, Route 1 was known for its roadside attractions, motels, service stations, and stores. In the 1770s, the very earliest days of the road, there was a landmark in Howard County, a tavern known through the years as Spurrier's and Waterloo. The tavern or the inns were along the major roads of the day. It was, it was the roadside of America of its time. You'd stop and have something to eat, spend the night, get your horse fed, reshod, get your wheels repaired on your wagon or your stagecoach. Anything that you needed to be done at that time would have been done at the tavern complex. Besides supporting all these people that were transiting through the area, the inns and taverns also served the, lo the locals. It was a meeting place. You could hold any kind of meeting there. It was a social place for dining and having something to drink. Most taverns would have a license to, to serve spirits. So all in all, it was the center and the locus of, of the entire area. Thomas Spurrier moved to Howard County in the 1720s from the eastern shore of Maryland. He bought land in western Howard County and and the location would be above the current intersection of Brighton Dam Road and Highland Road. He called the land Spurrier's Lot. One of his sons, William, about 1760, married Ann Brown, a woman whose family lived in the southeastern part of the county, and she inherited 200 acres of land where they built a house. It so happens that the land that the Brown family owned contained the intersection of two of the major roads in the county, the east-west road that goes from western Marin, Maryland to Annapolis, and the north-south road that goes from Baltimore south towards what is now Washington, D.C. They had the house close to the intersection, and in, in 1771, William was able to obtain a license from the local government to operate a public tavern. He also was able to arrange later in in 1771 to have the road redirected slightly so it passed right in front of his tavern. We don't know a whole lot about Spurrier's Tavern in the 18th century when the Spurrier family run it, but it pops up a few times in notable historic events. The first was at the end of the Revolutionary War in September of 1781. The American and French armies that were heading south to cut off the British at Yorktown, Virginia, moved down the north-south roads, camped one night at Spurrier's Tavern and then moved east towards Annapolis along the east-west road to meet boats that took it down the Chesapeake Bay towards Yorktown, Virginia. Also, since Washington lived at Mount Vernon and the government was in Philadelphia when he was president, he had occasion to move up the north-south road numerous times, and we know from his diary that he spent 
many nights at Spurrier's, and one occasion which is noted on the metal sign that's, that's at the intersection is, is when his horse died and he was forced to spend the night there. To resolve a family dispute over ownership of the tavern, the court ordered the Spurrier family to sell the tavern in 1811. Rosalie Steer Calvert purchased it at an auction. Rosalie Steers came to the United States in the 1790s along with the rest of her families. There were refugees coming from Belgium to avoid the wars that were a result of revolutionary France. She met and married George Calvert in 1799. When her family moved back to Belgium in 1803, Rosalie, her husband George, and their daughter Caroline moved into Riversdale. Besides the estate of Riversdale, R Rosalie's father left her substantial funds to invest. Although the family had gone back to Europe, they still didn't feel confident enough in the investment climate to take their funds back with them. So Rosalie, using her contacts, invested in bank stock in Washington, D.C., bought stock in the National Road on the advice of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, and engaged in other kinds of government bonds and other interest-yielding investments. 24 June 1811. Mon père, dear father, I thank you, dear father, for your permission to buy properties for my account when they are offered, which could become valuable for my children. And I announce to you with pleasure having made a purchase which seems extremely advantageous. And instead of the five percent you said would satisfy you, the income will be eight percent. I am enclosing the advertisement. For its time, the tavern was quite a cash cow, and of course, since it was so lucrative, there was a danger of somebody else building a tavern nearby to, to uh, provide a little competition. So what the, what the Calverts did is they bought the land from the Dorsey family that ran along the north-south road to ensure that nobody else could build property on it. In addition, in 1817, work was started on the Washington-Baltimore Turnpike, and conveniently, George Calvert was president of the Turnpike, so he was able to ensure that the road continued right by the tavern. Riverdale, 19 October 1816. Mon père, dear father, the Dorsey property of 505 acres was bought in July 1812 for $7,000 or a little less than $14 an acre. The property adjoins the Spurrier track as 200 acres in very fine forest, but the rest is quite poor soil. However, as it is only 11 miles from the flourishing city of Baltimore, and the new Tumpac Road will pass through it, it will surely increase in value each year. Another advantage of owning this property is that it assures the stability of our tavern because if someone else owned it, they might well build a second tavern which would greatly decrease the value of the first. When Rosalie bought the tavern, the Spurrier family had already leased the tavern to a man named Henry McCoy on a seven-year lease. His lease continued until at least 1815, and then she had her own leaseholder, a man named Ezekiel Merrill, and he ran the tavern for many years. 
they had no direct hand in, in running the operation. The person who had the lease had the responsibility for taking care of the farm, providing fodder for all the animals from the stage lines and the freight lines, and just paying a royalty to the Calvert family. It's always desirable for any tavern to have to become a post office because in those days there was no mail delivery. Everyone had to come to the tavern to pick up their mail, to drop their mail off. So this was a tremendous draw for more local patrons to, to stop by, pick up their mail, talk, maybe quaff a beer, talk with the, ta the tavern keeper. In addition, postmasters were able to descend and receive their mail free. And it was typical that the that the newspaper publishers in Washington would send their mail to the post offices. So the, the tavern keeper, keeper at Waterloo, Mr. Merrill, would get the newspaper and he could post it on a bulletin board or put it out in the tavern, and this was another way of attracting customers. The tavern has actually had several names over the years. It started off, as we know, as Spurrier's Tavern. When the Spurrier family leased the tavern to Henry McCoy, he changed the name to McCoy's, which is typical for the leaseholder or the tavern keeper to name the, the tavern af after himself. Rosalie wrote her father that when she had a chance to name the tavern, and she must not have been able to do that under the terms of the lease the Spurrier family had given to Henry McCoy, she was going to name the tavern Antwerp after her family's hometown. Well, by the time she was able to name the tavern, the Battle of Waterloo had occurred, which was very close to Antwerp. It liberated her family from the wars that had been going on since the 1790s, 25 years. So in honor of that battle, which happened in Belgium, they named the tavern Waterloo rather than Antwerp. Caroline Calvert Morris, the oldest of the Calvert family, eventually inherited Waterloo Tavern. Caroline Calvert Morris was born in 1800 in Annapolis. She and her family moved to Riversdale in Prince George's County in 1804 after her maternal grandparents moved back to Europe. Caroline grew up in Riversdale. There wasn't a local school that pleased her mother. She decided to send her to a well-known school in Philadelphia called Madame Grulins. Caroline went there with a number of her first cousin's children. Her first cousins were Martha Washington's grandchildren who grew up in Mount Vernon, including George Washington Park Custis, who later built Arlington House, where Arlington Cemetery is now, and who became the father-in-law of Robert E. Lee. Caroline went to Madame Grulin's until 1817. At that time, her mother was ready to present her to Washington Society. This happened to, the timing of this happened to occur when James Madison was leaving the White House and the Monroes were coming in. Mrs. Rosalie Calvert was not pleased with the Madisons because they declared war against England, resulting in the War of 1812. Rosalie considered the British the savior of her native land, Belgium, and hence the name Waterloo for the name of the tavern, celebrating the British victory that saved her family's home. On the other hand, she was well acquainted with the, with the Monroes, and this was a perfect time to present her daughter to society. Caroline had a, several suitors in Washington society, all of which she turned down. She never married while her mother was alive. Her mother died in 1821. She finally married a man from Philadelphia, Thomas Willing Morris. At the time of the marriage in 1823, George Calvert, bestowed a monthly allowance on the family. Besides that allowance, Thomas Morris practiced law, first in Philadelphia, later in Baltimore. That's the way it went for the family until 1834. At that time, the b and Railroad was building its line between Baltimore and Washington. There was a section of the track being built east of the tavern in an area called Jessup's Cut. Jessup's Cut was named after the supervisor who was responsible for cutting the railroad through a hillside right close to the tavern. In November and December 1834, the crews building the railroad rioted. The rioting spilled down the hill, down to the local area where the tavern was. Some of the tavern buildings were destroyed. 
That seemed to be enough for Mr. Merrill, who'd been running the tavern for the family since about 1818. In July of 1835, there was another fire that was so extensive that the tavern ceased to operate. It probably was not worth the family's while to rebuild because at that almost exact time, the railroad was finished and people preferred taking the railroad cars to taking the dusty stagecoach. So George Calvert was cut off from a substantial income flow, not only from the fact that he lost the income from the tavern, but he held substantial amounts of Washington Turnpike stock and of course the traffic flow was muchly reduced so there was far fewer tolls collected and far less dividends paid on the turnpike stock. George Calvert's solution to this problem was to stop the income that he'd given to Thomas and Caroline Morris and to dump the property on them which left him with a ruined tavern and 400 acres of farmland. By the late 18 30s, 1839 or so, the Morris family had put the tavern together in such a way that it, was, that it was usable as a farmhouse and they moved in and Thomas Morris went from be, being a lawyer to becoming a working farmer with his 400 acres. Caroline died in Baltimore in 1842. My dear mother, you were no doubt apprised by my letter to my sister Margareta of Caroline's intention to come here for the purpose of consulting a physician. She did so. From the first, Dr. Wright, who was called in, did not entertain the slightest hope of a cure and thought she would be more comfortable at home. I accordingly named yesterday week as the time for return, but the weather proving bad and cold deferred until yesterday last, when I hoped she would be well enough to do so. She thought herself better and proposed remaining the winter under the idea that the doctor entertained hopes of her case. In this, I now understand she was mistaken and that he did not mean to excite hope. Today, before breakfast, she felt better, as Anna says, and was anxious for her breakfast. Soon after, she became worse. An abscess broke and she became alarmingly ill. At once, I was sent for, but from some delay, the messenger did not reach me until about sundown, perhaps a little before. I left home by five o'clock, at which hour she breathed her last, calmly and apparently without pain. Most affectionately yours, Thomas W. Morris. Caroline is buried with the Morris family in Philadelphia. After Caroline died, her daughter Anna took over the responsibility of helping her father run Waterloo Farm. Anna Morris was born in 1826 in Philadelphia. Little is known about her life before moving to Waterloo in 1839. One of the close family friends of the Morrises was the Murray family who lived at Rockburn. They had quite a few children that were the same age as, as, the, as the Morris children. One of the sons was named Frank E. Murray. He was a young midshipman in the U.S. Navy. He was named after his father's Longtime friend Francis Scott Key, the author of the, of the uh, national anthem. Anna Morris married Frank Murray in 1848. After Anna and Frank Murray were married, Anna moved in with her mother-in-law at Rockburn. Her father-in-law had already passed away. Much of the time, her husband Frank would have been at sea serving on a U.S. naval ship. To, through the 1850s, the, Anna and Frank had four children of their own, and things were quiet until the Civil War when, like so many Maryland families, the Murray family was split. Frank Murray re remained loyal to the Union and served, continued to serve in the U.S. Navy. Her, his brother, Edward, on the other hand, who was a West Point graduate, joined the Confederate Army, serving in a Virginia regiment in Lee's Army throughout the Civil War. After Anna moved to Rockburn, her younger siblings and her father continued to live at Waterloo Farm. Her father was never particularly fond of the name Waterloo. He'd changed the name to Glenthorne. In 1852, Anna's father died. Before they sold the property, they changed the name back to Waterloo, sold the property, and divided the assets among themselves. 
and his sister Rosalie never married, and lived in Howard County and died in 1878. Her brother George moved up to Philadelphia where their Morris relatives lived, practiced law, and continued to manage the American investments of their grandmother Rosalie's Belgian relatives well into the 1870s. Frank Murray died in 1869, and Anna inherited Rockburn, where she continued to live until her death in 1900. When Anna died, she was buried at Rockburn, next to her husband in the family plot. Later, the family relocated the graves to what is now the old Grace Episcopal Church in Elkridge. Anna's children and grandchildren continued to live in Rockburn until 1954. At that time, a distant cousin of her husband's inherited the property and lived in it until the 1970s when, the, when Rockburn passed out of the family's hands. The Waterloo property was sold piecemeal over the course of the first half of the 20th century. The area around Route 1 and Route 175 was commonly referred to as Waterloo into the 1950s. Because the local area is served by the Jessup Post Office, located on Route 175 in Anne Arundel County, the area is now more associated with Jessup. The Waterloo name is still used today. West of Interstate 95 up to Route 108, a section of the old Waterloo Road still exists. A park, a middle school, and some of the shops in the Lark Brown Village Center all use the name Waterloo.